So, um, for background, I'm relatively new to, to ledgers, um, and before ledgers, I worked in identity management um, on the enterprise side for a company called Ping Identity. So, so I was involved in uh, a number of initiatives around federated identity, standards like uh, SAML, OpenID Connect, which accomplished some of the use cases you talked about for portability of identity. Um, and so for me, coming from that background, I historically I was skeptical of the value proposition of public blockchains for identity. But I was also skeptical of the value proposition of public blockchain, so I'm, I'll confess I'm, I'm adapting. So, I want you to convince me of the value proposition of blockchains for identity. Specifically, if you could, what is the unique value for the ledger? This publicly available ledger, what does it give us that a centralized solution wouldn't? What are we mitigating with the ledger? Um, okay, so I think that there's a number of ways to answer that question that is, uh, yeah, so let me start with the, with the end. So what are the ways that a centralized database is not as effective as, at maintaining the identities potentially as a decentralized solution? And this is what we, we centered our white paper around actually, so I've thought a lot about this. Um, when you look at something like identity, which is so important and so intrinsic and so human, um, this is something that you have to make a decision. Do we want a centralized authority to be issuing this, or is it better that maybe we uh, have this ourselves and then we can go to an authority to get an attestation? I think that that's kind of an important philosophical point, but it's less a technical issue. Um, from a technical perspective, I think centralized databases have been proven to be um, vulnerable to identity theft. If you look at the large cases of, of identity leaks that have happened in even just the past year, um, there, have been, there have been quite a few. Um, beyond that, a uh, centralized identity work, um, held within a single database kind of pre presents itself as a single point of failure. Now you can mitigate against that and you can create different um, defenses and firewalls around the system, but one of the really interesting analogies that I've heard from, a, from another company um, is that this is sort of like creating a giant castle and putting up big walls around the castle and putting a moat around the castle and putting alligators in the moat and you hope that nobody can get in, but eventually somebody always gets in, whether it's Equifax or Uber or whoever. And really what might be a better approach is to take all of the treasure that you were trying to keep in the castle, which is your identities, and you spread it out throughout the kingdom and you put some coins in each of the little chests in everyone's house throughout the kingdom. And then everyone's coins in their little chest are um, alone a lot less valuable and, and much less of a target, right? So it's far less likely that someone's gonna go and try to hack into your computer as opposed to Equifax's database, which has 249 million you know, identities in it, as opposed to one singular identity in someone's laptop, right? So I think the, the attack threshold and the surface um, area to attack is also far less. So, so that's kind of a start from why a distributed system might be better than a centralized system. Um, and I think why we should use blockchain, which is kind of the second question, which is if we agree that a decentralized system might be a better approach than a centralized system, we have to make the case for why blockchain or why Swirls or Hashgraph, which you may be biased, but I won't say that. Um, I think that the blockchain use case for immutability has proven to be a good one. Um, but we personally as a company see ourselves as, as sort of blockchain uh, layer agnostic. We, we sit in the application layer. We could absolutely, uh, Jason, one of our programmers and I were talking about how we might be able to provide a uh, identity infrastructure for Swirls where somebody could be holding the Swirls currency um, in their in their uh, Hedera currency in their wallet. I'm anyway, using the right terminology. And, and that could be stored in the wallet and they could use their same identity proofs which they gained and they stored as a DID um, in the Hedera blockchain. And, and really, I think these DIDs and the portability of a DID is, is where um, these companies will start to get traction, right? I'm not the only person building an identity blockchain company, but I think what, what is different about um, the companies who are gonna succeed and the companies who are gonna fail is the interoperability with other companies, right? So we're not trying to build a closed ecosystem 
where you can only interact with the self key wallet or compatible with with Sovereign or, or Indy, and we we've submitted a DID spec like like Uport has. So if you have a DID in any of these systems, they'll be interoperable, and you can anchor this DID to the blockchain so that at a certain point in time you could prove that you're added to the system. This is the document that was added, and it was done the XYZ date. I've been talking for a while, so I'll, I'll pass it on. I do have more things to say. But I'll, I'll, just note that the advantages, I'll just note that the advantages you cited were security, not privacy. And I, I acknowledge they're related, but they're distinct too. Yeah. So obviously they are related in a certain way. I think how uh, Zcoin and Zero Null Truth supply this identity would be in how Zero Null Truth work themselves, so you can prove data over some specific subset of data. And I think that was discuss discussed tonight, so the classic example is given is like if you're given a, an output hash, you can prove that you actually know the input to that hash function or the pre-image, without actually knowing, without actually having to reveal what that um, uh, actual hash is. And that in itself, I think is enough for these kind of systems to prove that you have some specific subset of data and you know that input without revealing what it is. So I think that's how the zero knowledge proofs element applies to identity. I agree that our zero knowledge proofs are inherently connected to blockchain. They can be applied to state. Yeah, true. So you're saying like how that applies to the decentralized state or how yeah, that applies so to ledger. Like you proved years ago, Microsoft had a zero knowledge proof technology that never took off, but it was yeah. that, it was that same premise. And now ledgers have bulk I use the market. I don't think I was saying anything normal. <laughs> we have a more like a newbie question, like, you know, in this sort of decentralized identity, I'm, I'm really new to this sovereign identity thing, but what happens if you lose your private key? Does that mean someone hijacks your identity? You know, like, how does that work? There's, so yeah, I mean, it's a good question. There's different proposals. Um, one company, Uport, has proposed a uh, social recovery mechanism where you could delegate a certain number of your friends to recover your identity. Um, better pick your friends, right? Um, if, you, if you do that manner. Um, we're actually working on a, on a, uh, on a biometric-based uh, key recovery, although that's, it's fraught with danger, so we're really taking our time with that and uh, while testing it, because um, doing something uh, uh, biometric key generation or BKG is, uh, it's, in academia, there's actually a, a, a huge body of work that's been done um, by researchers and, and institutions throughout the years, so there's a lot of uh, evidence to build on. Um, I'm not sure if it's totally related to this conversation. I can geek out on, on BKG for, for a while. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so self-sovereign is about controlling, my sense of what self-sovereign is, is controlling how you present yourself to applications, right? Uh, whether through zero knowledge or just appropriately granular proofs. Um, so it's all about user control, and that's, that's empowering and that's all good. What about the application? What about their expectations of what identity attributes should be presented to them? How do you reconcile those two uh, tensions? Yeah, so when you think about what the application uh, is gonna ask for, I think that it's, we're really in, in the spectrum of, I like the spectrums that you used earlier, so I'll steal that. Um, in the spectrum of the companies ask us for way too much data and then they lose it, versus the companies ask us for too little data and they don't lose it, we're like way over here. So it'd be nice to be able to be in a world where we could say, darn it, the, the companies just don't have enough data on us, but we're, we're just not even close. Um, so w the way that we do it is, is we allow for the company to ask for as much information as they'd like, but we make it completely transparent and, and we force the company, well, not really us, more like the European Union, forces the company now disclose, um, what are you using this data for, what's your data retention policy, those type of things. So. Um, we haven't gotten any pushback from the companies saying, hey, you're not giving us enough data anymore. The user is saying, when are you going to sign up more companies? So that's, that's the limiting factor for us. So one for, for zero coin. Uh, where is the intersection between self-sovereign and privacy coins? Where, what are the use cases whereby it's relevant to appropriately obfuscate your interactions. So instead of hiding the fact that you're spending coins, you're hiding some interaction with the application. What does that look like? Well, 
Well, I mean, zero knowledge proofs also can be used. I like, you know, basically when you're talking about self sovereign identity, you're choosing what data you give up. At the same time, zero knowledge proofs also allow you to, let's say, that I want to prove that at this date I have a certain balance in the bank account or balance of coins without probably showing the individual transactions that allow it. And zero knowledge proofs kind of allows that. So in the sense that it's kind of like a control of how much data I want to give. I'm only proving what I need to prove without having to expose everything about it. So I guess that's like, you know, potential use case. Of course, like, you know, there's also like talks about using zero knowledge proof in like uh, if you're using it in a power, like oh, was it we power and all these other like power type of uh, blockchain systems where you have a smart meter and you are well I guess it's not actually related to sovereign identity but uh, I'll just finish that part. Uh, basically, what you can do is that in sort of like this electricity type of situation, you have to prove that you consume that amount of electricity. Zero knowledge proofs allow me to prove. I consume this amount of electricity without showing the individual usage, which may have some privacy implications as well. But you know, as for the sovereign identity, I really am not an expert in this area. But I guess it's about zero knowledge proofs gives another way where you can selectively prove something without having to show, like, you know, take off all your clothes and, and uh, show you all how to move them. So uh, we'll end with that lovely visual. <laughs> But I, I did hear a use case, if I heard it correctly, for privacy for minors, being able to demonstrate they did proof of work, but not show the actual value. <coughs> Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, everybody here on the panel. Ruben, Edmund, and Tashi, thank you very much.